Hello, hello, lieber Dirk. Uh, I have to switch to English now. Um, I hope people don't mind if I just say two words in German. And Dirk, you're you're German as well, and you're, uh, uh, you know, even though I don't want to introduce you much, but you're one of the great um, sound engineers, one of the greatest that I know. And your specialty is recording, like in the say, like the traditional ensembles and stuff. And uh, and I'm saying it right away at the beginning, like like your specialty, uh, and this was like absolutely shocking in a positive way for me, is to capture everything at the recording stage. So there's sort of like very little, uh, even though you do can tweak things, but there's usually very little to do um, finalizing a project and everything is kind of like set up in the recording. So I'm very interested in talking um, with you about that. Um, so Dirk, what is, what is the, uh, um, I saw some photos, uh, I think on Facebook, um, of you recording a big orchestra recently. What was that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that even though I try to capture everything, I do like to uh, leave the mistakes in the studio. <laughs> so oh, sure. um, not, not everything is being captured. But um, yeah, no, it's it's uh, been super busy lately, I have to say. Um, uh, which is really odd. But uh, on the other hand, I think with the whole COVID situation, many artists uh, had a lot of time and had some also some time to think about what they wanted to do. And um, so for us recording people, I think it has been um, sort of a surprise that there are so many projects. Um, and now that um, some regulations are getting a little bit leaner again, um, it's also possible to to travel abroad more, more often again. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I've been trying to uh, work together a little bit more with colleagues over the past few years, because um, uh, this can be quite a lonely <laughs> profession. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's also something we can talk about later. But um, I've, I've, I got fed up just always working by myself, uh, either during the recording sessions or especially after. Um, so I've been trying to sort of find um, colleagues that I enjoy working with also on a, on a personal level and sort of um, uh, join forces in, in creating better quality products. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things sort of that came out of that um, was this big recording with the orchestra and um, soloist, um, um, famous um, soprano, um, Sonia Yoncheva, um, Bulgarian um, singer. And um, the producer of that recording was uh, Jonas Niederstadt, who is a colleague of mine. And I took sort of the role of balance engineer, recording engineer. Uh, and we um, went to Genoa or Genova in Italy and recorded her uh, with big, uh, like the big opera arias from Puccini and, and um, um, other composers with large orchestra. So mm -hmm. that was super exciting. Uh, and of course, it's uh, a big trip and um but um yeah that that was that was super enjoyable um work and and um uh, we are we even continuing now on another project next week so i'm i'm sort of now in the final sprint trying to finish a lot of post production before on monday uh, so the day after sort of in 2 3 days uh, i'm i'm also going with jonas to um versailles in, in france to work at the, the um, historical um, Opera Royale there and recording opera oh. for five oh. days. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I already already have a question or two. Mm -hmm. um, so you said that there has been uh, like more work for you than you expected uh, recently. And so is that uh, usually or mostly recording traditional repertoire or is there also some uh, uh, contemporary music? Um, it's both. Um, I think repertoire-wise, it didn't change that much in comparison to, to other times. Mm -hmm. So I have to say that I think many, um, many musicians saw this time as a chance to, um, to try new things and maybe um, sort of things that are a little bit off the beaten track. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, that, I, I mean, the year started out with um, with a, uh, an album recording in, in um, cooperation with the Deutschland Radio here in Berlin, uh, with a Kuss Quartet, a string quartet that I've all, also worked with uh, several times. And mm -hmm. they recorded only um, pieces that were written for them. So um, those are all living composers. Mm -hmm. um, 
and all kinds of weird uh, settings and combinations with like a like a sort of a, a beat poet and a traditional song a leader with uh, um, um, quite modern and and edgy kind of stuff uh, mixed. So it, it, that was yeah, that was something different <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. after recording Beethoven with them uh, two years ago. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. so so I think people have. have tried have seen that uh, they're more willing to take risks maybe in this time mm -hmm. yeah yeah that, i mean obviously that's not a surprise like i think from my from my perspective it wasn't like super clear and i think it's it's really depends on the individual uh, musician or composer um for me like the first the first few months of the COVID experience kind of like i was very uh, active and uh creating a lot and for me it's now that it's it's gotten very hard to kind of like um really be motivated to do things but i think i guess for other people it it, um, it just also depends on in which phase of your life this COVID thing hits you know mm -hmm. and, um, so but yeah, i'm i'm happy I'm, sure. I'm, I'm happy happy to hear that you have that you have work that's that's a very very great thing and you know as as you know it's not as as a self-employed uh, person, it's not a given that you can that you actually have work. So. No, and it's it's really strange because I mean you know this because we you know we talk talked about this more often is that that I'm I sort of I'm I, I love my work but I'm also partially a bit frustrated with it uh, for for several reasons and um, I, my initial plan was actually to spend last December and January uh, just doing my own things and, and not working for anybody else. Mm -hmm. And well, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so it's in, well, but I mean, on the other hand, it is one of the one of the few times uh, in my life where I was really able to say, okay, I, I I just treat this now as a also as a business, and 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 in these difficult times, try to to sort of um, yeah take the work that I get. And and I have to say that that um, strangely enough, the work that I'm getting now is much more fulfilling and and. Uh, enjoyable than the past few years i have to say so um mm -hmm. it's a strange coincidence i don't know why but um yeah so um yeah as, as you say I'm, I'm i'm very grateful for that but, yeah. yeah yeah and uh, it makes me hopeful too <laughs> you know like if you say yeah. it's it, it has changed for the better which which is good um yeah dick so maybe maybe let's just Kind of like um like i already said that i think that you're one of the greats and like my my interest usually when i talk to people who are real specialists or experts in what they do is how how they or how you in this case acquired uh your skills you know and so that's why it would be very interesting to me if you could tell us a little bit about how things started for you first of all and mm -hmm. then when you like got into uh, uh, being a, and you 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 tell me what even what what the right um, words are to describe what you do, right? So, and uh, and and how you kind of like then acquired all this knowledge. Mm. Well, well, I mean, thank you. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I think that um, um, I think part of of um, I, I can only speak for myself, and I think that the, the, why I uh, worked so hard on on trying to be good at this is that I, I think part of my personality is that I can obsess about certain things like mad. So I mean, if if you if you give me a name, well, that's a bad example. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> but um, if if you you know we we were looking for um, a property. You know, a while ago, because we we, we, we living in the city, we, we were looking for something outside and, and in nature, and you sometimes you find these um, uh, adverts without the actual address, but just vaguely where it is. And I'm telling you, I'll find it. You know, I'll find it in five, ten, fifteen, twenty minutes on Google Maps. I'll zoom in every little village, and I will find that thing. So I think mm -hmm. part of that is. Um, it's just this obsessiveness about things and, and trying and, and wanting to understand something completely and, and trying to acquire this knowledge and, and sort of making it your, your second nature. Mm -hmm. um, but that comes with a price. So that's why I'm mentioning it is that, that um, 
um, as much as people might think, you know, you're good or great at something, it's, it, it does come, I mean, what comes along with it, for, with me, I mean, at least is that it's also some, some form of, of self-criticism and, and that can lead yeah. to not being so happy. So, um, yeah, and this, this has been kind of like a theme even in, yeah. in these, these conversations that I've mm. recorded with other musicians. Mm. But we, we have come to the conclusion that on the whole, it's a good thing, right? Like to be... Oh, I'm glad to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good to know. <laughs> but anyway, so, I don't, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm known for, for rambling. Um, so yeah, I, well, I started actually, I started out making music myself. I think, I mean, I've been heavily influenced by my brother Tobias, who you also know. And uh, Tobias got a small keyboard when when he was in his teens and I'm three three and a half years younger than him and he was completely uh, he, he loved synthesizer music so um, he was always listening to uh, Jean-Michel Jarre, um, Vangelis, uh, Tangerine Dream this kind of thing uh, and our actual our very first CD was um, the single I Won It All from by Queen so that was mm -hmm. the actual very first CD that we ever had but um, so I was, I think I, that, that sort of was the music that we listened to and that we knew of. And, and um, I just sat behind that, that keyboard every day for hours and, and just fiddled around, not having an idea of what I was doing. And sort of that, that developed and we were, you know, um, I was very lucky to have a fantastic music teacher in high school um, who supported a friend of mine and myself very, very much. And I played, uh, I started playing saxophone uh, already from a very young age. So I think, you know, I, I started basically being a musician and, and I wanted to make my own music. So I heard something on the radio and I wanted to, to make the same sound and make the same thing. Um, and sort of what, what you need to make that happen is also technology. You know, I mean, if you want to record your own music, if you want to do that at home in your sort of in your studio, <laughs> then then it's necessary to, to put it on, on a cassette or, or whatever we had it back then. Um, yeah. So that sort of it was it was we borrowed a mixing desk from from school and these kind of things, and and slowly with a friend of mine together we bought uh, our first synthesizer, then a sampler. I, somewhere I got an old Atari for 20 euros, you know, something like 20 euros, which now is uh, uh, impossible to get it for such cheap. Mm -hmm. So we, we started trying to make our own um, electronic music. And somehow in, in, in the last year of my, uh, my school time, in the 13th year of, of German school, um, I decided that I actually want to make that my work in some way or another. So record pop music, actually. No. So your, um, I don't know, like your Leistungskurse, so the, mm -hmm. uh, the main uh, subjects that you had in the last couple of years in school, uh, was that was music part of that? One of them was, was music, yeah. We, we, we were the first um, year, we were the first year that um, didn't have this uh, Leistungskurs Grundkurs system anymore. We, had, oh. we were the first bachelor uh, system uh, class. Um, but but yeah, I think you could still um, uh, decide that that uh, one of these subjects was your um, uh, exam subject, and, and I made music one of my exam subjects. Um, and which so, which one was the other or the others exam job subject? Uh, I think German it had to be anyway, so it was music German. English? I, I have no idea. Physics? I think physics, but okay. I remember. <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember mine. It was because it was uh, mathematics, music, pedagogy, and uh, in, informatics. So oh, really, wow. really all the all the things yeah. I still use. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> No, I remember the music was very good, but but the other subjects weren't that great. So yeah, uh, I always had an interest for physics, but uh, I think it's 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 fine that that it turned out this way. <laughs> so. Yeah, in a way, in a way, you're you're dealing a lot with physical reality of uh, oh yeah, you know, in the recording no. situation. So that's uh, and and you know like. Uh, 
at least like how I experience you, and I, I just, just say this here at this this point is that you have like almost like this intuitive sense of of how to place the microphones and be, be, uh, probably because of your experience over over, over decades, you know. So so that's that's really uh, um, because when I think of physics, for example, this you know mm -hmm. like like for some, I think it's you know if you see it as a science, it's one thing, but you can also um, develop a certain uh, intu intuition with the uh, with the physical world and that's kind of like how I experience your recording and just my just my two cents here <laughs> so did you did you did you then immediately go on to to, to study um, music um, it's it's an interesting point what you just said and we, we should come back to that later um, mm -hmm. I yeah I, I wanted to go to Germany actually when I applied for the um, tone ingenieur so like the sort of sound engineer course in Düsseldorf. Uh, but at oh, that time- so it was, you, were, you were in the Netherlands, right? Sorry, yeah, I, I, I was born in, uh, in the Netherlands and I grew up there. Uh, mm -hmm. My parents were German, are German. And um, so we spent, I spent all my childhood in the Netherlands. So first mm -hmm. uh, some, somewhere close to Rotterdam and then um, later in uh, The Hague. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but- um, so yeah, I wanted I wanted to to go to Düsseldorf, um, but um, at that time I was uh, playing a lot of um, jazz saxophone, so uh, mm -hmm. really like bebop, so Charlie Parker and uh, this kind of thing. And um, and my entrance exam in Düsseldorf was playing Charlie Parker solos, you know, uh, sort of, and 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 they were sitting there in in lots sort of in suits, uh, black suits with white shirt and. I still remember one of the guys asked from the jury asking me, so um, haven't you prepared a concerto? <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> so um, I never got even to the second round there, um, mm -hmm. which in retrospect, I'm really, really glad about. Um, but uh, f by coincidence. Um, so that was Tone Engineer, right? So that, that wasn't. Tone Engineer, yeah. yeah. That, that wasn't Tone Meister. It wasn't Tom Meister because I wasn't good enough in piano. And um, I see. Mm -hmm. Meister, they they need you to um, to be really really um, accomplished in piano playing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, actually, The Hague has a conservatory, the, the Royal Conservatory in The Hague, and that had a course called at that time music registration, which was modeled after the Detmold Tom Meister course. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the person who um, was the head of the department was the guitarist in the big band that my saxophone teacher was leading. So <laughs> I was able to do a late entrance exam and uh, then ended up in, in the Hague uh, studying there in my hometown. Mm -hmm. How many years did you study there? Um, well, officially it was four, but um, already in my second year, I, I was absent because I managed to get a, an internship at what used to be Polygram, so the, the Philips Classic Studios uh, in the Netherlands. And I didn't spend, I spent basically my second year all the, all the time away. Um, so I think in the end, I, it took me six years to get my diploma, but I was basically already working while studying and I wasn't spending that much time in school anymore at all. So I, the ideal situation actually. Yeah, sort of, yes, yes. I mean, in, in, in a sense, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying for like maybe the experience itself, but just mm -hmm. having the opportunity to, to get into the real world and do real work or, you yeah. know, I think that's, that, that's a good thing, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that that year there at uh, the, the company is called Polyhymnia International, and it's, it's still um, 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 uh, sort of a very busy studio, especially for high resolution and surround recording in classical music. Mm -hmm. And um, that one year of internship there was um, incredibly intense. I mean, first of all, it was um, three hours travel every day, back and forth, and mm -hmm. then wow. at least like 10 to 14 hours a day. So um, that was usually how it went, um, mm -hmm. but it it was incredibly formative because um, uh, with Polygram in the Netherlands, they always spend incredible effort in getting a good monitoring situation. So they had um, or they have some of what probably are the the some of the best listening rooms in the world, mm -hmm. and um, so I was able to sort of really train my hearing and, and sensitize my 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 ears to. 
um, to everything that comes out of loudspeakers. Wow. So that was incredibly helpful. And of course, working on projects with very uh, accomplished and famous uh, classical artists was, was incredible. Mm -hmm. So just because I'm curious, like the first, um... Like you know, the the cliche is that the intern, at least in a in a, a commercial rock and roll studio, let's say, um, has to has to make the coffee and stuff. Yes. And <laughs> was it like that for you as well? Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, they 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 uh, they had a very good um, automatic espresso machine, so they just <laughs> needed to push a button. So I, I would have been redundant. Um, no, I mean, what their system was, and and I think. Till today, I think that's a really very good and well thought of system, well thought out system is that they um, looked basically at the production process um, from start to finish and they let the interns start at the end. So I started with doing quality control on masters, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. sitting there listening through if for any electric problems, any acoustic problems that might still need some attention. Mm -hmm. And then you slowly go back and um, do some mastering yourself, like basically only putting the PQ codes, um, you know, writing a DDP master, or even in that time we had the Umatics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, and then you would start loading in tapes for, um, for the editors. So um, you would get a score from the producer where all the takes were written in within the music. And then you would have to sort of organize, okay, we need take 48 and we need take 20 at this place. But take 48 comes back later, so I'll probably have to load in a bit longer and this kind of thing. And that was all done with 24 track dash machines, like these old Sony dash um, um, 24 digital 24 track machines. Mm -hmm. Half of the tapes were always sort of uh, had a too high error count, so I was running back and forth to the archive all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But this way, you were able to listen on the tapes what the producer was taught, uh, saying to the artist, what the artist was saying back to the control room during the recording sessions. So I wrote down a lot of things uh, that were very, very uh, practical in the beginning because I heard other professionals and other producers saying them. Um, and at the same time, you started understanding uh, the method and the technology and the possibilities of post-production. So at the time when you sort of were ready to go with them on a recording, and maybe later in your career uh, would produce recordings, uh, which of course at the time as a student, I was doing that sort of on my own on other jobs, but it meant that that you know everything that would come later. So every decision that you would do as a producer by saying, I want you to start here because you were thinking I want to cut two bars later, you, you know that you cannot, let's say you cannot edit at that place or you cannot start at that place because the edit will be difficult and these kind of things. Or um, the other way around, sometimes you rather want to ask the musicians not to play something again because maybe it's just, you know, at some point it's just gets annoying because you know you can fix it later with just one cut, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's what, I, what they made me do. They do very, very simple things, maybe just like compiling CDRs at the time for, for artists, loading in stuff, and then slowly um, um, putting edits together uh, myself, which were then controlled by somebody else. And later, of course, sort of, um, taking on um, editing or mastering projects uh, alone. So this this uh, first, like, like compiling from CDRs, for example, uh, which software was it that you used for that? At that time, it wasn't even a software. We probably mostly did it by hand with a CDR recorder and, and, and then and, just playing it back from the DIT, from the dot tapes. Okay. Um, but um, what they were using was Sonic Solutions. So mm -hmm. um, I think mm -hmm. nowadays it's called Soundblade. So um, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. they were one of the first studios at, in the Netherlands where they uh, used uh, the twenty four track Sonic solution. So um, uh, they had like a, a year. Which year was this about? Like, I think they started using that in the nineties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting history. As they 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 started uh, using the the. Uh, uh, digital mixers that were developed in-house by DECA in, in Great Britain, or sort of the UK. And um, uh, then they asked a very tiny Dutch company to make their uh, mix down mixer, which was a genius concept at the time. Incredible. I mean, it's, it's too long to explain, but it's, uh, what was it called? Uh, I forgot. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, 
take a look at that. Yeah, and 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 part of that was was going uh, starting editing um, in the box, let's say. No, yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But when I started there, they were um, they were still working on the twenty four track Sonic solution. Sometimes in the thirty two tracks, um, but um, they slowly started to transition to uh, Pyramix. Um, so I started, I think, with Pyramix version three. At that time, when I when I started there, and I think now it's on, on thirteen. <laughs> and you're still you're still using it, right? I, yeah, I, I bought uh, bought a Pyrex myself during my studies, and mm -hmm. um, um, I still have it until until today. I mean, the system changed and and, and it evolved and so on, but yeah, I'm still working. Mm -hmm. So so this initial work there as an in intern did not, um, as you explained. Like started at the end and you know went mm. went backwards. So when did you do you remember like the first experience where you had to record something um, that then kind of like was actually being used? I think uh, I think my first commercial project was um, was for a CD-ROM, <laughs> mm. um, and it was uh, with the Nederlandse Bach Vereniging, so the Dutch uh, Bach. Uh, <laughs> ensemble uh, and um, uh, and it was supposed to be for uh, school children um, and it was an interactive CD-ROMs uh, around Johann Sebastian Bach's Matthew Passion. Um, mm -hmm. So the idea was that they would be able to, um, let's say, listen to a, a complete Tutti um, orchestra choir piece and then say, okay, I want to switch off orchestra one or I want to switch off choir two and orchestra one, so I hear the, the others. Um, so we basically overdubbed uh, complete parts of the Matthew Passion wow, that's, <laughs> in, that's, a, in a small church. And, um, and that's insane. How did how did you do that? I um, mean, like, like was there have, a click a click track or? <laughs> yeah, I, I um, at that time I think Pyramix didn't have an internal click track, or at least I didn't find it. So I, mm -hmm. I remember spending. The night before the recording at midnight in my in my student room recording uh, my metronome my hand metronome all the entire <laughs> tempo so i could i had i would have a click track for the people to <laughs> to be able to sing to and record to now no that that was a fantastic program it was um um initiated by a, a german friend uh, who who's now teaching at the conservatory in the hague and his name is daniel salbert and he was a choir conductor and 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 music theorist at the time and, and uh, he had these these wonderful ideas for projects and it was realized through um, um this that's not really a company of stichting is what they call it um don't know mm -hmm. the english word so mm -hmm. um like a non-commercial they used government money to to uh, realize this project mm -hmm. and yeah it was fantastic i mean it's um we discovered that that uh, the viola parts are the most incredible parts in the Matthew Passion sometimes, you know, if, if nobody, but nobody hears them. <laughs> so if you hear them like this, it's, you, you can't hear that viola part. But if you if you actually listen to it solo, because we had to overdub it, then, then yeah, it's, it's incredible. Mm. Mm -hmm. And children were able to, to draw a line because there's, there's all this symbolism in the music, right? So there's, there's um, the moment when, when 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 it's about the devil or that there's this snake uh, theme right and and there's there's this snake kind of line sort of in the in the, in the actual music score that you can see so the children were able to sort of draw uh, move their own notes and, and and sort of to make their own snake and then you would of course have to be able to hear it so mm -hmm. we had to you know sample basically every single note of, of the instruments. And I think we had for bassoon, uh, violin, and two others. Mm -hmm. And I had to sort of cut them so that they would fit exactly with the right length and so on in this game. So that when, when they would be attached to the, to the right playback uh, mechanism, then it would sound like a continuous played, uh, played line, uh, which then could be changed all the time and you could hear it differently and so on. Which is funny because we recorded them, of course, half the tempo of what it was supposed to be. So we recorded everything like bop, 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 and so on. And um, then they decided later it had to be double tempo. 
And that mm -hmm. works really well for bassoon because the attack of the bassoon doesn't change yeah. that much. But for a violin, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's spent a lot of cutting and trying to make good <laughs> attacks of a violin somehow. So yeah, it was, um, it was the f my first commercial product was quite, uh, quite difficult. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, you're reminding me of the, like the early days of the CD-ROM projects like when when people were still kind of like very creative with uh creative ideas mm. uh, what you what you could do with multimedia and that was before Absolutely. multimedia was something that yeah. was available on the internet right like because it was yeah. it was too slow and so it was like the cd-rom and uh, yeah it, i mean crazy days when and uh, like sometimes just just occasionally but maybe well i'm not looking but um, it seems like this kind of project has become a little bit rare. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. you see that that uh, like big companies like Google they create something interesting that you can that you can play with, just like it was in the old days of CD-ROM. Incredible, and and that was that was really that was really like the first commercial project you worked on. That's that that really and again you I think you got lucky there with uh, mm -hmm. something where you had to. Had to solve so many, so many problems, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember it well because I, I asked my teachers at the time uh, for advice um, on which rates I should ask because I was completely inexperienced, and they basically told me, "Well, you're so inexperienced, you should ask like only very, very little," um, and they they didn't really helped me out a lot. So I, I, I took a student loan to buy my Pyramix at the time. And I spent uh, like a few years paying it back. But I found out later that the budget of this project was, uh, you know, noticeably over 100,000 euros. And <laughs> um, my fee was so low that it would have the, probably they, they, they thought like he's joking or something. But I, I could have I could have gotten back my um, complete loan with that project and still earned money if I had just, if I had gotten better advice from my, my, my teachers at the conservatory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's not, not, not only professional, but also life lesson. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's a little bit, I sometimes have the uh, feeling and you know, like maybe I told you that I uh, worked as a, as a nurse for a couple of mm -hmm. years. And I saw I saw how the um, um, the uh, what is like the, the 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 chief medical directors in the in the hospital treated the uh, assistant doctors and stuff and mm -hmm. and it kind of reminds me of that where like you know they simply just don't give you the information so that you make the mistake you know like you ask for not enough money and then later you find out and that's like the life lesson learned there uh, i'm not i'm not sure if i if i always agree with this method but it's it's very common i mean at least uh like in the hospital it was very common this way. well it's i mean for me it, it, it's also maybe that's why i still mention it after all those years is that that um what what i do not understand is if, if you are a teacher uh, you know, and I have been, let's say, privileged to, to, to have been asked to teach a few times during my, my career, um, then I think you get a lot of responsibility. And if somebody now would ask me, you know, even a student that I don't know of, or even a student that I might not like that much, or who I think is a bit arrogant or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what kind of amount of money should I ask? I, I just I find it so irresponsible to to not give decent advice or, or or just explain, you know maybe my question was wrong, but I'm experienced enough now that I know that you know that I would tell tell my student listen you're asking the wrong question, you should actually think about this and 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 please be aware that you know that even though you're not experienced there's there's sort of a there's a, a minimum, also sort of. That you have to that you have to ask for, even if it's if it's just not being too cheap in comparison to your peers or something like that. You know? Yeah, and because then, they, then they, you know, there's there's so, fight for themselves, but it's, at least you should as as a teacher you should give decent advice. Yeah, it's sort sort of an ethical issue, I think, mm. 
and I, I agree with you that decent advice and and you know like um, this has also really been a theme sometimes in these conversations that um, sometimes the, the people who who teach are not necessarily the ones that even have the the real world experience maybe it was wasn't the case for you and you know with your teachers but sometimes mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes they don't really know the answer you know that's also um, something to expect um, yeah. yeah i i mean i remember when when i started the business with bernhard um mm -hmm. the graphic you know uh, graphic design stuff like it was really uh, it was so difficult because we had no idea how much our work was worth you know? yeah yeah okay so so like so i'm interested now in in um Sort of, did you did you have a mentor then later on, like somebody who, or were you kind of like on your own most of the time, um, figuring things out on your own? I I think I was on my own most of the time, to be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I did have people that I sort of uh, whose work I idolized, um, and. Up until today, I think like this uh, Erdo Hoed is someone who, who's working at Polyhymnia where I did the internship. Um, he made incredibly good recordings. I mean, still up to date that I'm, I'm, I'm just very, very impressed by. Mm -hmm. um, there's some so, sort of some, some older generation engineers that I don't like very much and so on. But um, so, of course, I, I always ask questions. Mm -hmm. And what I used, uh, and I tried to sort of, I tried to just understand everything and every little technique that is out there. Mm -hmm. um, most of which wasn't really that known in the conservatory. So I, I was sort of, I was forced to look outside. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, what I would do is I just, at, at that time, the, nobody was buying vinyl records anymore. So they were thrown out, basically. There were like these shops where you can get a one vinyl record for one euro and so on. So my mm -hmm. friends and I would always spend a lot of time there. Um, but what I found out is that with the bigger booklets, very often in classical music, and especially in opera recordings, they would have one large uh, picture of the recording session. And mm -hmm. of course, you would see how the people were seated and where the microphones were put. So I tried to learn from that a lot and, and apply it with every little chance that I got to, to my own recordings. Um, yeah, I remember that sometimes there were even diagrams in, in those mm -hmm. older... Um, cool. Yeah. 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 So yeah, so no, I, I think I, I just um, I just tried to do as many recordings as I could. So um, mm -hmm. even with with the time that I was an intern, I, I would spend Monday to Friday in the studio in Bayern, and uh, Saturday Sunday I would be in school or somewhere else doing a recording. So um, yeah, no, I think I did um, probably yeah hundreds, maybe maybe I, I even counted one time. I think I almost did like five, 600 recordings in my, during my studies. Wow. And then of course you, you sort of, you, you um, learn all the intricacies of, of different techniques. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not, even though at that time, I think I was probably relatively dogmatic about what I thought was right. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's not so much really about the technique, but knowing which technique to use in that specific situation. And mm -hmm. if you know, uh, if you know, if you have enough experience with every single technique in all kinds of situations, then it's much easier to sort of to make this translation, you know, to, to the situation you're in. Yeah, I think you're, the advantage really of your, your story here, of your history was that you had um, lots of access to good recordings hmm. that you could sort of like you so that you could acquire a feel and a knowledge about what you were actually going for. Because I think that's, yeah. that can be like re really the big problem um, for students, especially mm -hmm. something like, like sound engineering that you really don't know what the good sound is or what the preferable sounds or what even what, even what the fashionable sound is like, because I, I, you know, I'm, I would also be interested about this, like if there were like fashions and how classical recording sounds over you know within the last 30 40 years or something um so so having access like being there listening to masters uh doing quality control um sort of opened as you said like opened your ear to kind of like know what you're going for when you're actually recording mm -hmm. absolutely true 
Yeah. And I think this was a recurring theme, theme also um, with my, my friends and, 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 and colleagues during my studies that we were sort of trying to understand what it is that we that we that we're working towards to you know and what in, where, where sort of what is the ideal thing that we want to achieve mm-hmm. um, and i found over the years that it's that that this thing is very much at least for for classical music it's very much neglected i think is that that when you hear something um what does it actually mean sort of how, how why does it sound the way that it does you know, and, mm-hmm. and there are a lot of preconceptions about recording technique and, um, and people think like, okay, it sounds, uh, if you use this, it's going to sound like that, or this recording sounds this way because they use those kind of microphones and so on. And very often that's not the case. Very often it's something different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think like with the, uh, say the, the traditional ensembles, uh, which sort of like always have the same, uh, Mm. This sort of distribution of instruments, same way they, they are set up. Um, there you can sort of like uh, maybe apply some sort of template, um, you know, that has been has grown over the years. Um, but and this this is my next question: like, what what? How do you approach recording an ensemble that is a totally unique and new? Uh, combination of instruments and maybe even where there is a specific idea about how the instruments should be set up. Mm. I mean, do you, do you, do you actually use your imagination before you actually get a chance to, uh, to hear it? Mm. Or do you wait till the last moment, let's say to where, you know, obviously you have to bring and organize the right equipment and things. So I know the answer is you have to think about it beforehand, of course. But. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? So, like, we're yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's this. Um, it's interesting point because it it doesn't happen that often, at least in classical music, um, and even in baroque music that or early music uh, repertoire, that there's a setting that is very much out of the ordinary. And mm-hmm. if it's sort of out of the ordinary, then usually those are instruments that are a part of the, you know, sort of of, of the, the collection of traditional Western instruments. Um, and maybe they're just set up differently. Or, um, for example, next week in, in Versailles, we're recording uh, this opera. The, the, the ensemble only has two violins and a double bass and two gambas. And for the rest, it's all plucked instruments. So it's, it's an old harp, uh, it's a theobo, arch lute, this kind of, so a lot of percussive, a lot of plucked instruments. Um, and not so much, let's say, um, a string orchestra with some additional um, colors. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's, um, I recorded, um, I worked for a few years at a, at a Dutch publishing company and they recorded, all, they sold only music for wind bands. So symphonic wind bands, but also brass bands and what is known in the, the Dutch speaking countries or Flemish speaking countries and French, the, the fanfare orchestra, which is sort of um, a mixture of, of, of things. And those orchestras are never the same um, so when you get a commissioned piece, let's say for a Swiss orchestra where they have nine trumpets and, and like um, four clarinets and you go to the Netherlands to an, a military orchestra where they have, let's say four or six trumpets and 12 or 20 clarinets, then already your balance is off. Yeah. Um, so that's very interesting. And, and I, I also worked in, lived in Asia for a while and, and recorded um, traditional Chinese instruments and there's even traditional Chinese orchestras. So the orchestra is not traditional, but it's made up of traditional Chinese instruments. Mm-hmm. Um, then the only thing you can do is, is try to uh, hear it live. This is mm-hmm. one thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe rely on uh, other people's recordings, mm-hmm. which can be helpful to identify sort of what typical problems are or um, just maybe how it, um, how it might sound with, um, you know, just with microphones there. But then just trying to understand the individual instruments or instrumental groups and then how they project the sound and, and um, um, sort of try to build it from there, you know, know, know in advance how are the, how are the groups going to sit, um, how do these inter- instruments project and interact with the acoustics, what is their musical role and function, mm-hmm. and then build it from there. And that is, at least for me, it's really an intuitive process. Partly you have to sort of get your facts straight, but um, you know, and, and if you don't know them, you have to research them. Um, 
but then it's it's trying to sort of use your imagination and, and be as prepared as possible and, and, and think of alternative methods of capturing what you need to hear. And then when you're there, you need to be prepared to make changes if you need to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, You know, like we, we haven't really talked about the, the very technical aspects yet. And I think that's okay because um, like from what you just said, like I, I kind of like got the sense also that there's uh, something about the communication with the people involved that is also probably part the big part of what you do uh, because like when i'm thinking about just practically and you have like say the conductor um, if you are the producer and the uh, engineer you may also want to sort of I, and that's the question like do you sometimes want to kind of like overrule what the what the conductor <laughs> says if something that's sounding bad or is not blending or or would you kind of like take a step back and try to find a solution in the setup of the microphones to kind of like mm -hmm. um, correct <laughs> the mistakes that uh, you know the, the imbalance that maybe is present uh, or would you even go so far and have an influence on on the setup and you would say okay if like if like the first violence would move over just one meter um, do you do something like that, or is that all in the hands of the of the orchestra and the, um, the you know I don't know who, who's responsible there? Well, ideally, of course, it's it's something you decide on together. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. parts are maybe already just pre-decided by um, you know some orchestras purposefully sit in a certain way. You know, you have some established seating orders in, in classical orchestras, symphonic orchestras. Um, for certain repertoire, I always prefer having them sit, let's say, in what they call a German way so that the violins are spread left and right, mm -hmm. um, especially for romantic, but even early classical or classical repertoire that I think is just also how the music is supposed to, to be played um, and to sound. Yes. Um, but then, you know, if it's, if it's a certain orchestra that is not used to sitting this way, or let's even say that there's a certain um, tradition of, of sound in, in orchestras, then you just don't do that. And you might not even raise the question. So there's a lot of um, idealistic things and things where you know that might improve the work or might mm -hmm. make things easier. But then there's a whole big amount of pragmatic things and, and practical things that um, just do not always allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. One thing, for example, I mean, moving, moving people around um, is always possible, I think. It's also always um, um, easier when you have small ensembles or chamber music groups, yeah. or mm -hmm. let's say soloist and ensemble. But of course, you want to be prepared for that. So you want to talk about that in advance, so that it's not a surprise. Um, what I always try to do is, is ask people, okay, um, you know, for recording, maybe you would have to sit a little bit differently than you're used to. But please, prepare and rehearse this way already. So then you get uh -huh. used to it. And then you're not having to do this change at the session, which of course might be annoying. Uh -huh. um, and then the initial reaction always is, I don't feel comfortable, which I completely understand. But then again, if it's, if it's an orchestra and you want to move something, there just isn't time for that. You know, if, if you have time, if you have enough time to make a decent sound check, you're already very lucky. Because um, in, in orchestral sessions, it's, um, usually three hours with a, let's say, 15 to 20 minute break or how, how, whatever rules apply. Um, so you get practically maybe two hours and 40 minutes of actual recording time. Mm -hmm. So you have to you sort of, if you, you have five to 10 minutes to get a balance, you're lucky, let's do this. They want to record straight straight from the beginning. So you have to, have to talk to the conductor and maybe to the orchestra and, and see how can you buy some time or how can you, if you want to make changes, make them before you actually start. So before the time starts ticking, um, everything should already be in place. Yeah, yeah for so sure. That's why I, I always say preparation is, is you know, 75% of, of a good recording. And in every way, it's not even technical or, or something, but also musically and so on. If, if everything's prepared and everything's fine, then basically you just have to have to push the button and let them play, but yeah. Yeah, this is this is very interesting because that now I can see this is definitely one of the points where where I can see some frustration potential frustration happen when you <laughs> when when you're not when you know when the musicians let's say 
don't really have musicians or whoever has you know mm -hmm. the say like um uh, don't respect the engineer as somebody who also needs some time to get things set up and uh yeah. and anyway i mean i would i would assume that you, you tell me if that's true like with the, like like the the very best orchestra like maybe they have more experience or a lot of experience recording and that could either mean that they are even worse in just kind of pushing things like with the engineer or they say okay no we're relaxed and like mm -hmm. we we give him a little bit more time but so, oh, it's, but it's, it's a is it yeah. a union is it a union thing for them like is there is there that's why it's three hours or yeah no it's it's with orchestras it's it's unions i, I mean it, it depends on where you are in the world how if it's a union mm -hmm. or if it's somehow something else but mm -hmm. usually these groups are um, extremely well organized and, and uh, workers rights let's say are are just taken care of um so it's it's like um, you usually have two two sessions of three hours each per day, and then you have one and a half hours in between of, of break. Mm -hmm. um, so and you can sort of rule of thumb is that maybe you can get ten to fifteen minutes of final program time, so it's sort of edited music uh, out of one session, if if it if all things go well. Um, in film, they sometimes take a bit longer so um, I've done four hour sessions uh, but then it starts to become also sort of it, it gets tricky that if you want to do more sessions per day you have to really be very careful with how to distribute break, uh, uh, pause like break times and and, and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and that's also something that very often um, uh, things go wrong I mean um, if, it, if it's if it's a well-organized orchestra and ensemble these things are all perfectly taken care of but as soon as you're moving a little bit away from that, um, you start like so suddenly lunch breaks are only 45 minutes or an hour. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not even so much about saving time. It means like um, you put down your violin, you're putting it in your case, you're going outside. The moment that you're on the street, already 15 minutes have passed. Then you have to go somewhere if you know if you didn't prepare your own lunch you have to go somewhere you have to stand in line you have to buy it you have to sit down another 20 minutes have passed so the moment that you're coming back to the session you sort of you you, you barely ate and you didn't yeah. have actual break mm -hmm. and 20 minutes to 30 minutes into the second session your blood sugar level goes up and then sort of your, your body and you get tired Mm -hmm. So it did this this entire thing. It's it's there's so much more to this organizational aspect than many people are aware of, mm -hmm. and that is sort of um, I don't even feel it so much as you described maybe as a thing of respect. Um, it's 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 not that I feel like people don't respect me. It's it's so because I mean we're all in the same boat. I mean I'm not trying to to push my agenda. The thing is I I, I am there to make sure that, that the musicians or whoever is sort of leading that project is getting the best possible result that we can get. And, and I'm there for them, and, and, or, or for, let's say for the final product. And um, so these, these kind of things are not so much of, of getting my way. It's just, it just means uh, I want to make sure that everybody is able to perform mm -hmm. the best way possible. Yeah, sure. And, yeah. and that, that, is, that is a source of frustration very often. So, I mean, it's like, for example, with this with seating or, or let's say, please rehearse in a certain way so that during the recording you're used to it. You don't want to know how many times, you know, this was organized and was um, take, sort of was agreed on. And then you come to the rehearsal before the recording and everybody's sitting in the old way. And, and so, you know, so there's no, not really a point anymore to making that change, which of yeah. course means that, that you're making less of a good product because for the recording, yeah. it's not as good as it could be. Yeah. So there's, there's little awareness of that. I don't. I think um, I think in, in in people who work in in, in real sort of in, in studios, let's say jazz musicians, pop musicians, there's there's a much higher awareness of that. Um, in classical yeah. music, there's always sort of this reference of um, a concert situation uh, and these kind of things, and then uh, people just want to play. And, and so the, the, the recording person very often is someone who interferes in the natural environment of people. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, I just, I just had like so many, so many thoughts, like as you were telling these <laughs> stories, but like, like, um, but when it comes to you, I think it's just so incredible. And, and this is also what I think the, the, the listener is not, uh, doesn't know, like the level of responsibility you have as the sound engineer, like, even if you have a producer there, right? Like, even if you have somebody else there, but as the, as the, as the sound engineer, it's it's a huge responsibility just imagine having having like that you know like 60 people on on stage let's say recording playing and you're making you make a mistake yeah. you absolutely know? and I, I think i've 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 worked a lot um as um sort of as a, what people call tape op so basically just operating the the the, the recording machines yeah. which used to be tapes <laughs> but nowadays it's mostly computers um maybe co main computer backup computer and maybe even something sort of that is a backup machine that is that is mechanical mm -hmm. um, and well first of all um if that doesn't go smoothly then everybody else in the control room will be nervous because the producer doesn't know when he says uh when he says let's start the recording that the that the recorder is already rolling um, or that if sort of if the end of a piece, you know, sort of you, you just finished a piece and there's still sound, acoustical sound in the in the room, that nobody is cutting off the recording exactly at that point. So you have to give if 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 this person is able to give trust to everybody who is sort of in the hierarchy higher in the recording. So if the producer knows he just he just has to do his thing and everything else around him moves with him. That's such an empowering feeling for the producer, so he can just do his thing, and he's so much more focused on the music and on, on the artists. Mm -hmm. And secondly, when the artists come in and they want to hear something, I made it a sport to to listen to what they are talking about. And while they are talking about something, I'm already in the machine or in the computer or on the tape recorder, whatever, winding or scrolling to that spot that they are talking about. And they're talking about this E major, e major chord in, in bar 25. And I'm looking at my score and I'm saying, okay. And I'm like two, like a half a bar before that. And they're turning around and the producer is saying, um, could you maybe find, and I'm saying, yeah, yeah, the E major chord in bar five. And they're looking at me and I'm starting play. And it's like, <laughs> what, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not trying to say, I mean, look how great I am. I'm, I'm just saying, if you take that work seriously, then you can make or break a recording. It's um, well, you can, you can make it great, but but it, it also can be the other way around. But then that kind of work also becomes fun. But it's typically something that people look down upon. So yeah, yeah which, is, think, which but, is crazy. It's crazy. I mean, like I I saw you when when you recorded the string quartet in Heart, Heartland. Um, it was absolutely fascinating. Like you you were both in the producer end and and the engineer seat for that. And uh, it was so clear to me that the um, the way that you were communicating, um, and as you were communicating, you were taking notes and you were the tape off, right? So it was like it was 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 amazing how how you were always like one ear was always kind of like listening to what they were talking about <laughs> between takes, and 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 you you uh, made these notes in the scores like you had these numbers i don't know what which system you used for that but it was pretty amazing mm -hmm. like you were basically marking up the edits as you were recording yeah. and and um, that was absolutely stunning and then then also like the the say the psychological aspect of how you were talking to them um i thought it was i thought it was really really great you know there was this um very um I can't. Well, I, I, you know, you were you were talking Dutch with them, so I, I didn't understand everything. But, but it felt like it felt like it was all like very, very civil. There was no need mm -hmm. ever to. Um, there was never a question about the um, in this setting, at least, about the um, uh, authority. Let's say that you had. Well, I mean. To be honest, the Matangi Quartet, of course, is that there are such wonderful people that also that makes it so much easier because they already bring this this nice, comfortable atmosphere to to the recording. So they're just by themselves, they're already you know relaxed and, and, and nice people. So that helps. <laughs> but um, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, it's um, I've taught myself over the years, at least the, the past four to five years, to start 
making the edit plan in the score during the recording already. Um, and that sounds like a trivial thing, but um, uh, that's actually not that easy. It took me, I think, maybe 15 years to get to that point that I, I feel comfortable you know, writing down, okay, um, this is what I take from take five, this is what I take from take 18 and so on. Um, still, of course, I will deviate from that, but um, the, the, the basic thing is that it, it um, forces you during the recording sessions to make um, maybe what you could call destructive decisions. So, you know, it's, it's like um, you make a decision and it's final. Mm -hmm. um, if every time you just write down, okay, take five was good, take six was also good, and so on, and, and but you do not decide which was the one that you're going to use, you really do not know what you have. You really do not have an idea of how you how how you want to um, how you want the composition to take form later. Okay. So I might not might not even always use the exact edit plan that I wrote in the score, but having one gives me the confidence to know we've got this covered. And of course, I've sort of, I've, I've made my own system of always writing options. So I always have an alternative, at least one or two alternatives for the same passage that has been decided upon, uh, which might have a bit of a different character or which might have been a little bit um, cleaner or, or, or say objectively better, but the one that I think we will use is more charming, these kind of things. But um, the basic idea is that you decide there what is good and what is not, and what will you use and what 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 will remain? Because if if you do not do that, then why are you asking them to do something again? Or why are why will you give the suggestion to um, let's try this a little bit more uh, with a little bit more energy, or maybe even with with a little bit you know a little bit more laid back or this kind of thing? Because why else would you ask for these kind of things if you do not know what it what it should be in the end? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and I mean just just the the, the pure uh, and because this is not really I mean like some people do it but it's rarely done in uh, uh, the not classical world that people kind of keep track of of um, the takes or that they label the takes or in the case of the recordings that you make like even though um, even though things are multi-track recordings with lots of microphones. But yeah. it's not it's not that you go in and you can just like replace or just edit one track. You always have to edit everything together, right? Yeah. So so that's why um, your skills, for example, in reading the, your your score reading is amazing. I find like you, it's like even with uh, with Zauberberg, for example, where everything looks the same, sounds the same. Also, like mm -hmm. if you don't know where you are, and if you wouldn't take notes about which take starts from which which measure of the composition for example yeah. you would be you would be completely lost so there's also there's there's like more to it than it's not just a, a bonus that you're doing it it's actually necessary mm. uh, like, like you say to take these uh, take decisions in the moment um where you say okay like you 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 sort of have this it's almost like a rating system right in a way yeah. to keep track of yeah yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, there's just there's a, I mean as as a classical recording producer you have to be a, a good administrator. Um, yeah. I, I tried for a while. Um, there's this um, uh, producer in the Netherlands, Tini Matteau. Uh, she's the wife of uh, Ton Koopman, who's a, an early music uh, a harpsichordist, organist, and a conductor. And um, she produced all of his almost all of his recordings. And the engineer was one of our teachers at the conservatory. Um, and she basically um, said she would mark, give a mark to every single bar of every take. Mm -hmm. So you, you would have the Dutch marking system. So like from basically from zero to 10, with 10 mm -hmm. being the best. And then she would say like bar, okay, um, take two, eight. Next bar, take two, seven. Next bar, take two, 10. And I mean, for me, that's just a bit too much work. <laughs> but um, but she is able to do that. And, and the thing is that she always knows for every single bar and every single place exactly what she has and what she doesn't. And um, I mean, she's a fantastic musician as well. And I know that, I mean, for her, that there's more to her work than just giving, you know, grades. Um, but, but principally, um, she has got administration so well, well thought out that, that she has never any doubts of what, what what, the, what what she has and what she still needs and what what is good enough. 
and sort of this this yeah this is something that you always have to have to take into account in classical music as a producer yeah yeah incredible and and administration is the word that that you guys mm. use for that well um not in the score i mean it's uh, i think we, people call it score marking or i mean i make the edit plan in the score um administration basically is what you it's like this you know it's that i have it here like writing take one is mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. from bar one to two uh, take two is going from bar one to five and so so, but this you also, I think you also have. Some people write that in the score. So they mm -hmm. basically say like, okay, here in this bar, chop. I sort of, I taught myself on a separate paper and I still do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, no, 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 I, no, I understand better what you were doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but like I said, it's fascinating to watch, like to have the responsibility for the, mm -hmm. for the sound quality. So you, 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 you should notice if a microphone stops working, let's say, or just moves or it gets get gets hit or something you know like even that you should be able to tell while you're while you're taking while you're do admin you know administering uh everything else while you're talking to the musicians and it's it i i really i was really uh extremely impressed that's like because it's such a holistic it's such a holistic mm -hmm. musical musical activity that sort of uh um yeah, holistic i think is a good word it, it is everything somehow and and in that moment you are totally at service of the music and of the composer but also service of, to the musicians um so uh, it's it's really it's an incredible job really incredible it's uh yeah it can be a very fascinating job i think it's um um the challenge is not sort of to lose yourself in your own ego in that position. I mean, I think it's very easy to think of yourself as the person who basically decides on everything and who is making critical decisions and who should be telling the musicians what to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that should be a phase <laughs> that you get out of very quickly, because mm -hmm. I think it's very natural that, that everybody feels that way or, or works that way at some point. But um, at least for me, it doesn't, get you anywhere um, in the end. And it's it's not the most interesting road to take. It's much more, and, and that, this is something that I, I've, I've been trying as well for a long, long time. And it's also only the past few years that I feel what you just described with, with the communication with the artists is that, um, you know, that it's not becoming sort of, um, at some point producers are becoming robots. I think it's like, thank you. Um, um, that was a very nice take. Um, how yeah. about we do it again and so on mm -hmm. and, and i just i just would like to have a conversation with the people because that's not how you would talk face to face right? yeah, yeah um yeah. and i think that is that makes it more interesting is, is and, and that was possible with like with the matangis that is so easy that you just you just talk to each other you, you, you know i don't always have to say uh uh great take at the end or so i can just say you know and when they say how was it and you know I, i'll just say you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> and they understand and that is that is something that 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 is not only i think coming from um uh sort of the personal relationship that you have with people of course that plays a role but it's something that you can grow into i think it's, it, it took me a lot of effort a lot of work to get to this point that i just don't feel that i have to do have to behave a specific way in that situation yeah yeah, and yeah, yeah I you... think that's, no, I certainly you certainly you certainly didn't do that. I think that was that was really kind of obvious that it was, and this is what I meant when I said that it is mm. in service in service of the music. Really, it's not. It was not about your ego or anything, but just right. just just the fact that you were you were very clear in your communication of things weren't good enough, let's say. But that mm. was never that was never a judgment. It was just right. you know it was just it was just a statement for. A, uh, it was just the reality of the moment. Okay, we need another take, and and that's also, as you said, like how the the Matangis responded. And I remember that um, um, there was this one, and I think it was actually Zauberberg, where you, both you and I we said, no, it's enough. Mm. Like like, and they said, no, we yeah, want yeah. to we want to play another take. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, but, yeah. but that's the, that's a great thing is that that um, I think if if you if you because I find it much more respectful to tell someone, I think that wasn't really better than what we had, you know, or it wasn't good. 
um, then to sort of go around it, you know, and just like, mm, yeah, well, maybe we can, and so on. And that people always sense if you're being honest or not. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> I think, well, at, at least at, as long as they don't want to be lied to, right? That's another story. But mm -hmm. um, no, I, I think it because subconsciously, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the artists and the musicians, they, they feel that they're being respected for their work. And that's the great thing about recording is that, okay, so it, it didn't go as planned. Let's do it again. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's why you are there and you don't have to get it on, in, in one time, every time after five hours of working, you know. You know. So let, let me jump to um, a completely different okay. question. Okay, so let's just kind of like assume a very complicated, um, complicated in the sense like a really huge ensemble like orchestra and choir or something mm. like that. Um, and what, what, what number of microphones? I know that there are many different techniques. So, so what is kind of like the range? Like what is kind of like a minimal, minimal setup to capture something huge like that? And what would be like a big setup? Mm. Yeah. I mean, the range is everything from 2 to 32, 40, 48, 60. I don't know. You know, it's as crazy as you want to make it. Yeah. Um, the thing is that there's not really one definite answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'm, you know, like I'm, uh, like I know the number of tracks on microphones, but kind of like what would be the um, the concept, let's say, mm -hmm. of capturing? Like, how do these concepts kind of differ from each other? I think there's, um, I think the idea very often is that. Um, the less microphones you have, um, the more the musicians balance themselves and the less you interfere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I would go a little bit further. I think in the amount of microphones are linked to a certain technique of working, which mm -hmm. result in a specific char sound characteristic or specific balance. Mm -hmm. um, you can record a string quartet with two microphones, you know, if, if they're, they're well balanced and, and if you are lucky with the acoustics, that can sound fantastic. But if I like to work with six or more, you know, so everybody gets their own because there's a specific sound that is attached to this kind of working. It's not so much that I want to make the second violin softer, not at all, because anyways, if I do too much with my closed microphones, Whoever is playing soft will just be loud playing soft. So that's not natural at all. So there's mm -hmm. anyway, there's a limit to what you can do with a lot of microphones, which very, pe very many people are not always sort of, you know, are, are aware of. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, um, I think most is that, that a good thing is to keep it simple, but simple doesn't always mean um, few microphones. <laughs> so yeah. for something as complex as you describe it, you, you would, probably have to have four to five uh, microphones for a main sound, for main system sound. Then probably something for the orchestral sections, um, definitely something for the choir if it's in the far back. Um, if there are soloists, vocal soloists, the big question always is where do you put them? If you put them too close to the conductor, you don't have any control over the balance. So you usually put them behind or in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, then sometimes if the music is this way, there, there's a certain scene, let's say in an opera or there's something that just happens once, but it's so critical or it needs to be heard or something like that. You just have to have a few mics there so that it is covered. So suddenly you're a few mics on, but they're only used maybe 10 seconds in the entire two hour program, for example. So it's, there's so many factors coming to this. Plus there's always the practical side of things is that in a commercial recording environment, where you're making an album or making a recording that is being sold later, you very often just don't have the time to do things, let's say, idealistically. Mm -hmm. if, if you have a great take where everything worked, but I don't know, let's say that the, 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 the strings weren't strong enough, please just raise your faders a few dBs for that passage, you know, because everything was fantastic. So why would you have to do that again? It will take you one and a half minutes to regroup, to start over, and you could already cover something else, which mm -hmm. means you don't have to go into overtime, and overtime means all the musicians want extra money and this kind of thing. So <laughs> it's um, yeah, plus or, or that you know, and and also big thing of 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 microphone setups is being 
prepared for what's coming later. If the conductor comes in and you have the similar situation with you in the editing studio and you're like, let's say in the second or third edit, you're just before the master and he says like, everything's fine. It's just, I'd wish the, the, the first violins would have made a crescendo there. Then let's try to, to you know, um, emulate a crescendo mm -hmm. with the means that we have in the studio. Because mm -hmm. anyways, you cannot, cannot change it anymore if you already recorded it. Um, and then, of course, if you are the one person who says, sorry, I didn't have a microphone there, then next time you won't be asked back. So <laughs> there's, there's many aspects and many reasons why people work the way they do. Mm -hmm. And it, very often it doesn't have, necessarily, it doesn't have anything to do with how it's going to sound. It does, but um, there's these notions of, oh, it, it's, it, it, it's a beautiful natural recording, so they used maybe two or three mics. Or it's, uh, I don't like this, it's so direct and so on, they must have used 40 microphones. There's not necessarily always a relationship with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I was thinking. Um, so, just like, let's, uh, just the ten, more of the technical side. So, um, and this is something I said at the very beginning that I, I thought you have like this intuitive, almost like intuitive approach for, what works and i remember that the sound and this is like the only experience i had with recording with you so far of the string quartet was like that you you did actually go back um like we had the the control room downstairs and you had to walk all the way all the way, uh, way up to set the microphones and stuff and so that it, it but it didn't re, it didn't take very very long for you to kind of like set things up and get things into place where you were completely satisfied and uh, and I found that that interesting because um, and, and this is again like something that we already said like you must have some sort of internal reference for what what you're after mm -hmm. like and maybe sometimes you're not even aware of what that is but that's sort of like how I experienced that that you had like everything was very very clear like okay it's got to be like this and and so like where you know like from my perspective as a less, uh, much less experienced person, I would wor would be worried about like face issues, uh, mm -hmm. let's say stuff like that, where, yeah. where, it se where it seemed to me, and but you please correct me if I'm wrong, but where it seemed to me that you didn't even have to worry about anything like that, that because probably you would, you, you, you know what, this, what the right sound is anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there is, there is not even the concern of, something that you would have, where you would have to use a measure, uh, a meter or anything really, right? Mm -hmm. Or do you, do you use, do you use visual, visual feedback? Um, like for meters, obviously like the, the peak you, you definitely use, right? But you're not using like a, like a, a stereo width uh, thing or, or no. face cancellation stuff or anything like that, right? You don't. No, no. If I if I don't hear phase, then it's not an not an issue. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. And that's I mean that's kind of amazing because. Mm. Well, the danger yeah. is that when you see something that you imagine it's there, and and, and especially mm -hmm. in a in a tricky situation with like um, starting a three day or a two day or a four day session, and um, always sort of uh, trying to get the sound as quickly as possible, um, you don't want to be distracted by these kind of things. But I think, I mean, it's, um, hmm, um, well, you have to know your instruments. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, that is a fascinating and, and continuous um, exploration and, and, and learning um, experience, at least for me. I mean, it's, it's uh, um, you know, where does a violin sound good? Um, but what does it mean that it sounds good? Does, does, it, does it sound good there when it's a soloist in an orchestra or does it also sound good there when it's the first violin in a string quartet? Mm -hmm. So um, those are things that you need to be completely aware of and then um, know your sort of, know your exit strategy. If, if, if it doesn't work, where are the other places that you can go? Mm -hmm. And um, this is experience partially. It can help if people teach you things. Um, but then, of course, it's also hearing there. And I always listen to the instruments. I, I know where to start, but I always listen uh, to the instruments in the room uh, where the microphone is. And that is also not so as easy as you might think. It's because it's you, you have two ears and your microphone just is a microphone. 
So you have to translate that sort of to, to I, I visualize it for myself, like, like making it from 3D to 2D. You mm -hmm. have to sort of force yourself to, to, to flatten um, that what you're hearing. So you get a feeling or got get to get an idea of how it will sound on the actual recording on this, uh, between the loudspeakers or on the, on, on the headphones. And then be aware of how that is in the context. And so you go from instrument to instrument to instrument and so on. Sometimes it's also about, you know, if you have, because uh, a typical way of working in classical music is with uh, an array of main microphones, um, which are usually omnidirectional microphones. And um, then the question is, okay, if you put microphones closer to instruments as well, should they um, capture the entire sound of the instrument or should they rather not and capture only a specific part? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise um, it won't mix well, for example, yeah. or it will become too important, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think the fascinating things about microphone technique are, um, is not so much, um, let's say the objective part where you can say if, if, if somebody is sitting 45 degrees left of your mics, um, between the speakers, they will sound 25 degrees left or so. This is really something, I mean, this is something that you can quantify and that you can, can teach and learn and you can take a tape measure and these kind of things. Um, and then you will sort of approximately get there. Mm -hmm. The problem is that very often it doesn't sound good. Also it takes out every, I'm not there sort of to, to, to capture documentary style, what is happening in that room. I'm trying to capture the essence of the music and the performance. And I want to transform that into this other medium where it's being listened to in a completely different context in a completely different situation by people who might not even know the music already or might not even have a fascination or interest in it. And, and you have to get them engaged and, and get their attention. So there's, yeah. So I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but it's no, no, um, it's hmm. it's an answer. And you know, the reason why I was asking this specifically uh, at this point is because I wanted to say that you do actually have this these projects where you are the producer and where you're also the uh, the label, right? Like where you're recording yes. for your own label, Solar Records, and so oh. that means that what you just said that you as a producer there you are you are you are it's not about like as you say, it's not about capturing the reality, but actually creating a, a product, a recording mm -hmm. that sort of like has a, a depth of atmosphere, a specific mood, a way, uh, like a, a sound, right? Like whatever that means. Um, and where, where, the, um, where the compositions, where the music is presented in the best light. So yeah. it's, you know, so, so, and this, this is where it really, it very clearly is not, it's not just a technical musical, work but where it's also a creative work mm. and um and with with solar records you you i know that you do um always kind of like um, you know get these really unique um sound spaces right and uh it's uh it's cool you know it's i think it's such a such a cool thing it's it like I say it's it's from my perspective as somebody who does does like all these different things that contribute to the to the whole that is music production let's say where you like like from the very beginning you do this thing in one right. in one go and uh, it's I, I just find that so cool. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> it's, uh, well, yeah. it's it's also part of course why I started the label in the first place is that um, um, like in a typical working situation. You know, I sometimes get the question from, from musicians, you know, could you show me one of your recordings where you recorded something similar like us? Mm -hmm. And I always need try to explain to them, okay, I, I will send you, because I don't have any issues with that. But, um, and you can judge them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that this is how I would make it sound. It's always um, the result of a long process. Uh, in Like we talked about um, how you would, one, how you envision the sound of your music and how you were thinking of, of that uh, that the quartet should sound and, and in, in, in a good situation that always happens that conversation and if it doesn't happen maybe you already know each other and you have this idea and but this um, 
and then sometimes uh, as um, I think of as, as being a recording producer and a balance engineer, you are also a service provider. And sometimes the exciting thing is that you have to do something that is completely not up your street, you know? So you have to actually do something that you would usually not do yourself at all. Um, so when you, th I've, I've become very careful of judging other colleagues' works by just listening to them. <laughs> I'd rather just talk to them and ask them, why did you do it this way? And, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. very often they, they, the, the eyes will roll and they will say like, yeah, I would have would have loved to do it differently, but uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean it's good or bad. It, it's just mm -hmm. um, it's just the reality of, of working in a commercial environment. And so with the label, of course, I have um, basically a free hand in, in, in deciding that, but I have, always been sort of, um, it's like a drum that was was beat into me from, from early on is that uh, I'm always in service of the artists. So I, I it, for me, it's actually very difficult to, to um, say, this is how we're going to do it because I decide so, uh, at least for the sound. Um, I think I, I'll try to do that more, but in a sort of a more friendly, convincing way, or just also because I think that, because uh, I see that the sound is always um, part of the interpretation of the music that the artist is playing, you know, and, and so I, I want to sort of be, I want the recording to be a reflection also of the artist's performance and artist's ideas. At mm -hmm. least that's for me sort of the ideal version. But uh, but yes, of course, um, I try to make, so, uh, this, the label gives me the, 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 the freedom to be a little bit more daring than I could usually be. You know, sometimes I, I also use it as a just, to do something that is a little bit out of my comfort zone. Um, but I know if I force myself to do it this way, then the result at least will be interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at least it will be interesting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think for example, this, 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 uh, you've heard this uh, Baroque violin sonatas as well, right? I think, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think if I, if I, if I listen to it, when, when I listen to it now, it's not something where I would say, well, this is how I would usually record this, but, um, but I really like it, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I specifically uh, try to put myself in that place where I thought like, okay, I'm going to do this a little bit differently than what, what seems comfortable to me. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, that's where we um, uh, gain more experience, you know, that's, that's sort of like another yeah. the new reference point. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like I said to me to me it's a really fascinating. Um, but but maybe just tell me a little bit like we're already like deep into the conversation, but I'm going to ask you again. So what is what has been like the maybe like the most frustrating part for you then? Hmm. So many to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've got, I got. It's it's kind of like it's kind of obvious. Like when when you describe what you do, I think everybody can kind of like also imagine what can go wrong, you know. Especially in the in the on the on the human level and the communication. And if yeah. like the artist is not 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 happy, for example, or if maybe and this is this is something that also I I would say is true for myself. I don't necessarily always understand what I recorded like so maybe like there's an engineer who actually did a great job but then like I'm sort of in a in a, in a psychological space where where I'm focusing on the wrong aspects or you know and 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 where I would get pressures about things that don't matter where where yeah. you as somebody who has like this meta position uh sort of you did actually make the right decision but then and and that that's sort of like I don't know that that's where I feel uh, a lot of uh, potential conflict and frustration can happen. Yeah, I, I think there's, um, I just talked to a, to a friend of mine about exactly this point, this is that, that um, what frustrates me, I think most is that, um, you know, like we started out when I explained that sort of, I have this obsessive character trait, I think in, in many regards, I come out, I know it, um, but, um, Part of that sort of, I think, is also something very healthy because it means that that um, you question things and you want to gain deeper understanding. And you know, if I've 
I don't want to say that I don't want to make this into something deeper than it is, but I've, I've always been very drawn by, by Japanese culture and, and also Chinese culture. And having lived in Asia, sort of, I've seen the reality of, of, of how things are in real life. But um, what I've always been drawn to is the idea that um, something very simple can actually be something incredibly complex and uh, something where, where there's so much more behind it than what, what meets the eye. So for me, part of the work that I do is trying to understand what I'm doing better. Mm -hmm. And I cannot understand when musicians dedicate their life to the art mm -hmm. that they do not question what they're doing and they do not ask themselves why are things the way they are and why am I thinking what I'm thinking or what am I actually doing right now? It's, it, it seems that there's been that this ongoing shift that things are becoming more superficial, um, not so much from the quality of the work, because I don't know if that's necessarily related. That's probably another source of frustration, <laughs> but um, it doesn't, I mean, there's still, people still play wonderfully and, and there's this, uh, I mean, probably, more great musicians out there than ever before in the history over you know, the entire world. But um, uh, it seems like that these questions, which to me are such basic, such essential questions to what we do are not being asked anymore. And that is that translates to so many issues in, in your work. It's, um, as I said, you know, I'm, we're all in there together trying to make the best of something um, that in the end belongs to the artists. But it seems like they're not interested in, in let's say, us recording people, helping them with that. It's more like, you know, um, it's more like I, I'm, it's being annoying trying to do something better. And this is something that I've, I've come across the past five to 10 years more and more is that um, this, this effort of trying to improve things, which is an objective effort, and objective in a sense that I'm trying to understand um, the artists and I'm trying to be there for them. And sometimes that means telling them, I think what you're trying to achieve, you know, there's a better way to get there. There's, there's not maybe even an easier, but there's, there's a way that, you know, I always say if they, if they were really ego, egoistic, they would do what I tell them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because they would get what they want. Um, and this is just a pity. And, and, and um, I think that's par partially also because um, definitely um, the musicians that, that, are, that are being invested in have become younger and younger in classical music. I mean, in pop, we all know. But um, there's a different uh, structure, I think, in pop music, also because there's so much more money involved. Um, mm -hmm. But um, with not with with that lack of experience, they, 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 there's a lack of people guiding young musicians um, and young artists in the development of their career because everybody's so focused on just making money off them. Yeah, yeah, that you've, you've you've you know this last word like or the last words money making money. That really, um, and you know, like, I don't even want to, want to say this. So like, under, I could say understandably so. Understandably so, a yeah. lot of what, what is happening nowadays is that like, does this little bit more of more quality really matter? Does like, like maybe they, they would say, hey, Dirk and Marcus, they are crazy. Mm -hmm. They want to spend more time on this, why? We're only going to sell like 1500 copies of this anyway. So why would we spend more? I want to forget about this and I want to go home. And this is that obviously is very sad. And that's also why I believe that there is that there is like a, a group of people or there are certain artists that would not never do that. Right. Mm. But but when when the music and like the it becomes a commodity, right? So it's it's a product. It's nothing. It's nothing else. There's like the motivation is there's no there's no heart in it, right? Then what what happens is that um, that all efforts that you would bring in on your end, um, it's just a matter of um, it, it's predetermined that you're going to be frustrated. You know, there's 
Yeah, and, and yeah, and, and the, the system system supports it. I mean, that's that's the problem yeah. is that I think um, um, almost well, at, at least for example, for music publishing, um, the company that I worked for uh, became big um, with a few works, let's say, mm -hmm. and uh, one very famous work that's this um, Lord of the Rings symphony by Johann von der Um mm -hmm. it's, I think probably the most played modern music piece of the past 100 years or something it, it's a um, incredibly successful piece mm -hmm. but of course at the time you know it was you know nobody else wrote these kind of piece, music and 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 but nowadays this company well at least when i was there this company was sort of so streamlined and uh, so confident in knowing what would make them profit that there would be no place anymore for a piece like that. And I think every healthy company should always have, should always spend money that doesn't need to be um, returned. Yes. Just to give, give a chance for something that is so out of the ordinary that maybe they will make like uh, 10 times as much again. Because, but if there's no risk, uh, mm -hmm. if there's no calculated risk, that's how, how I should say, mm -hmm. then you will never have a surprise um, hit. Yeah. And um, for some reason, the entire system of music business, if it's uh, the streaming services, if it's, if it's um, how people, so even let's say how music, especially how popular music is being written nowadays for, for, for its purpose and how it's going to be listened to, it doesn't give that space anymore. There's no space in the system anymore for, um, just doing something properly and doing making a quality product because that is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. just this notion seems ridiculous already, you know. But mm -hmm. um, that is in the past how people did work, you know. So. And and that's where then people um, like you, uh, when you don't have the experience that the world is that way, right? You you sort of kind of like getting into a situation where you're basically being exploited for your passion, let's say, mm -hmm. where, the, where the people that are the, the system, as you call it, right, that, that kind of like uses you or utilizes you uh, sort of knows. Like the example of you asking for, you know, not enough money for that uh, very first commercial right. job you did, right? Oh. So as an ex, and you're so basically, like, okay, there's somebody who's really eager to do this, so, and, and he's not asking for a lot of money. We're definitely going to get good work from him. Well, let's do it, right? And so that's that's sort of like what is what's happening. It's uh, it's kind of it's a little bit uh, <laughs> telling, right? It's telling us how, how the world works nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's a pity that that nobody teaches you this also. And and it seems mm -hmm. like everybody's afraid. You know, it's it's even when I was studying, I already noticed that. Um, you know, I wanted to set up a company where, like, with three or two or three uh, friends, where each each one of us would have their own specialty. So, um, let's say a friend of mine would do um, large, uh, you know, live events. Another one would do pop or jazz recordings in a studio, and I would be sort of the classical guy. And the interesting thing for us would be that whoever had a job could take one or two of the others with him. And um, it's, there's no question about who's in charge. And for the others, it's only interesting to see something different because you can learn from that, you can get more experience. It's, it's a change of scenery, fantastic, you know? Instead of spending two weeks in your editing studio, you go to some, some large concert and, 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 and amplify uh, whatever, you know, a pop band or so, fantastic. I would do that all the time. But um, it's like nobody was nobody wanted to take that step. It's like everybody's like, oh, it's an interesting idea, oh, great. And so, but nobody wants because everybody feels like as soon as you do something with somebody else, you're giving something away. And yeah. I think this is this is one of the big problems, at least for um, recording, um, sort of the content creation part of recording. So people like me and, and is that um, it's such a competitive business, and and there it's such a sort of a limited landscape of uh, people who work in there that it seems like everybody just sort of is fighting to get their work and not trying to give anything away. Um, that's a pity because if you, if you actually 
work together and and uh, you could for example agree on let's give ourselves a healthy limit that nobody should work under you know <laughs> but instead you get um, it's like well, why why is this in, in recording not happening you know in, in every there's there's a lot of businesses where people just have sort of they organize themselves and they they there's an organization that represents them. You know, I've worked with com composers organizations, even film composers here in, in Berlin, for example. They, they talk in their meetings, they talk about, okay, how are we going to do with the copyright management? How are we going to do this? We need to make sure that there's enough money coming in so we can all make a living and so on. Mm -hmm. Recording, nobody's doing that. There's nobody talking about um, that, that there is this actual problem that there's always someone who's asking a price that is too low, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, maybe I, I'm just, maybe I'm naive. Maybe people will listen to this and they will say, well, that's just the market working. And if you're too expensive, then you're too expensive. But, you know. You know I, I, it's true, but I think the uh, it's it's also the other way around. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, sometimes maybe you should just ask for more. And and it's, it's the same is true for me. Like there, I have this one little story I want to tell you in, in response to what you just said. Um, which I experienced around the year 2009 or 10, I think, uh, when I was working for a private um, private school in Cologne, and they were um, and they they asked me to to do a training for their students. Uh, you know, that was a it was a, a job for me as a psychologist, and it was uh, training for like a creativity and sort of like personal development um, uh, weekend for the students. Yeah. And what happened was the following that I think I actually did a great job and a really great job, which meant that some of the people there stopped studying there. Oh, oops. Right? Which was not, yeah. it had nothing to do with me. Like it was mm -hmm. not that, that we talked about anything about like that there was anything wrong with the school, right? But people, they start, they start realizing they don't really, they don't want to be there. And so you see, this is this is a little bit like what you were saying, like that if you were if you're too good, yeah, you, the, the the there's it's a threat or it's you know it's a it's a threat to the system somehow, um, because and that's that's why you know like you, like being really creative with the recording, it's not really what people want. They want people to do that a good job and maybe also you know they want them to be better than average, but. They don't really want the the greatest engineer because that would mean that you would actually hear the wrong notes in the first mm -hmm. violin, right? So, and if you know what I mean, right? And it's this is just a metaphor, right? But but I I really think that's that's that is the case there as well, and it's it's. Um, yeah. That's interesting because I, I I think we talked about this once before. I just sort of I remember this story, but um, because uh, I, I remember my own story sort of is that that at, while I was studying a friend of mine um, uh, told me once that that some you know some students don't want to work with me because I tell them when they play something wrong yeah. and I think maybe back then I was um, probably a little bit more a little bit more blunt than I am today <laughs> so I, I have you know I have grown and I understand you know that criticism needs to be constructive but uh, absolutely, I mean, it, um, um, very often these kind of things have nothing to do with the actual work or, or the content of what you're talking about doing. It's, it's, it's more sort of, I guess at that time they felt that I was um, sort of, I, I was boosting their um, insecurities and, and uh, sort of not, not feeling comfortable with, with their, their own work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Like... Shows what, what, what sort of... Um, how many aspects there are to the, the things that we do, right? I mean, in the end, it's all about people. It's just we are people and we work with each other, and, and that's what this is about very often. Yeah, but you know, it's really um, like a, you know, be careful what you wish for is what comes to mind. Like, mm -hmm. so if you if if somebody asks to work with you as an engineer, let's say, then be prepared that that you will hear that 
you're not sounding great. And it's not the fault of the engineer, oh, right? So <laughs> I've warned you. Yes. <laughs> I keep true to my reputation. <laughs> but yeah, but you know what? That yeah. I'm, I'm sure that something like that happens occasionally to uh, mm -hmm. to art artists, you know, where where there's like a certain where they they think there's not a good match with the engineer because a certain aspect of of their personality, like a certain uh, buttons get pushed uh, right. of their psyches, right? And 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 uh, so well, in both directions. And I mean, it's it's, it's just it's it's like like I said, it's it's human, you know, it's people. It's it's like there are some people when I'm in the same room with them, I just I'm I'm just this close to exploding, and they haven't even said a word, you know. So <laughs> and but 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 you, I think this is something that. Um, I mean, when you get older, but um, I sort of, I, I found a way to accept that this is just, that's just how it is. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not my, I I've used to feel responsible for that. And I would sort of tell myself, you know, if I, I need to be able to do this, it's, it's my fault. And I, there must be something wrong with me because there's this weird tension and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, you, if it doesn't match, if it doesn't click, then, then, you know, it's it's perfectly natural to accept that and then just say, okay, it's it's just not a good match. And mm -hmm. maybe it's better you find someone else, you know, to mm -hmm. who will who will support you properly. Yeah. And part of my experience is that sometimes the 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 resulting work, let's say, is is very good nonetheless. Like even if the process that, that was difficult. Be, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a bummer though because it, it would be so it, it would feel better if if you sort of if you get the recognition for not feeling good that also the product is shit but <laughs> often yeah, that's no, not no. The case. yeah no i think it's just it's just a sign that in the moment there is a lot of work happening there's a lot of en energy there's a lot of uh, uh change happening right and that mm. is something that then feels like makes makes one feel uh, exhausted, you know, emotionally exhausted, and you know, I, I have this a lot when I'm when I'm doing recording sessions, uh, where sometimes it just feels horrible, right? Like, or I feel totally, incredibly tired, or and then I realize, then like my 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 brain kind of like my thoughts go to the negative side, where I think, okay, like this wasn't good, or blah blah blah, blah or you know, but then you know, with uh, having a few days off, like, and then like listening back to it after a few weeks and then realize, okay, this is actually very, very good work, you know? And, and I think that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's something that, that, that you hear, I think for a lot from um, like, let's say classical soloists who, who play many concerts per year, they, they, they always have, they, they very often share the experience that when they thought you know, it was one of the best concerts they gave. Basically, the audience was sitting there relatively mm -hmm. bored, you know. And sometimes when they're thinking like this is just today's it's not happening, you know, then there'll be like people screaming for encores and 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 and, and, and uh, bravo and this kind of thing. So it's you know, I think part of of um, working in an in the artistic field has to be, especially if you're someone who is creative and who's creating. Mm -hmm. um, is, is understanding yourself better as well and, and, and trying not to be in your own way, you know? And, and, and part of that means exactly what you just described is that very often it's, um, you know, feeling of discomfort or stress and these kind of things, it's, it's actually in you and it's not there actually, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. So Dick, That's I think- long, long road. <laughs> it's a long it's a long road exactly and and you you see i think i think this was a, a really fascinating conversation hmm. right and we and could you go on much longer we, we right? could go on like uh, yeah i know yeah. and maybe maybe we do a part two at some point yeah, like, we, 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 we listen listen back to this and we take notes okay ah we wanted to talk about that but we didn't and right, right. <laughs> I, I i'm interested in 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 your experience if i can ask um is that that um I, i've done like only a few of these kind of interviews and maybe one or two podcasts and this kind of thing. And I've always felt, you know, I, I prepared for them and I knew exactly what it was, what I wanted to say. And then I listened back and I thought like, this it's, it's just sounds completely ridiculous. And I know this. So I've, I've started now not to prepare at all and sort of try to be 
completely in a different place up until the moment that we started this Zoom conversation and, and, and then think, okay, let's just have a conversation and we'll see how, how we go there. And, and I'm just wondering if that's your, also your experience with, with sort of doing these, uh, yeah. these, these podcasts and stuff. Yeah, you know, I think maybe that's that's the the big difference when you know you said before that seventy five percent of the product that you record is preparation, mm. right? Like in your in your line of work, um, like in my line of work as a composer or or a performer, not of classical music. You know, this is like what it, you know um, preparation is is kind of like you could say it's nothing but it, you could also say it's everything but the preparation mm -hmm. is not it's not something that you can measure it's not something that is uh it's a little bit like uh let me use this example of somebody who procrastinates right so you 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 know like say you have a year to write a composition for orchestra but then like in the last week of that year you actually start and you right. finish it just a minute before you have to send it off right and yeah. And 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 this that's the that's the kind of pre because preparation there's preparation but then the question is also like in which time frame does the preparation happen, and so mm -hmm. with these conversations the preparation part kind of like moves into the into the process into the moment of talking to you, mm -hmm. so there's so there is no there's no real preparation there's yep. it's it, it's improvisation it's and again like you say it's this human it's the human uh, experience. Right, like it is just being human and talking to each other and and seeing and realizing that in the moment of committing to creating something, which is this conversation that we do, it just happens, yeah. and it it's not we don't need to prepare for that, you know, and and this is this is something like it's an important part in my uh, my improvisation classes that I give, right, where like the question is like why do, why do I need to learn anything? <laughs> to improvise mm. you do not really you 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 are already complete you're already perfect for right. that at any point and you just you just do it but then the question of it and this is the big psych psychological question right because some people they just simply don't do it mm -hmm. right so like that the problem moves to a different onto a different level into a, like a deeper psychological yeah. level you know would you say that maybe part of that um, is also that that sort of that you have to free yourself of, of let's say potential elements that will keep you from from being able to 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 respond and to to be free in, in, in what you do? I mean, it's it's sort of I almost feel like with with these kind of conversations that um, and I I've mean I've improvised on a on a moderate level in the past as as a saxophonist. Seems like that that there's sort of a vocabulary that you have to 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 to, to acquire, and you have obviously need to have the, the technical proficiency. But at a certain point, it's more about removing the roadblocks and removing the elements that might be in your way, so that you can actually be completely free and do your thing and and, and start being creative in that moment. And maybe that's uh, a little bit what you're saying, right? Is that that is yeah because you know, yeah, but even but even even this even this considerations about vocabulary or mm -hmm. it's it it really it really means doesn't mean anything, okay. right? Because because like as a human as a human being or you know like there is always a range of uh, expressive behavior available, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't it doesn't have to it doesn't always it doesn't have to come from a conscious place. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to come from from a pre-planned uh, uh, source, let's say, right? So, like, we can simply uh, we can simply um, go back and forth. It's like it's like like throwing a ball to each other, right? Mm -hmm. In a way, right? And so, as the the ball travels from you to me, like, I maybe have like a few seconds or milliseconds to think about what I'm going to respond. And, right. and, and sometimes, and this is the great thing, the great thing uh, about the English language um, is that in a way, this kind of improvisation is easier because in German, mm -hmm. as you know, we have to know when we start the sentence, we already have to know how we end the sentence. Right. Yes. That's <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, no, but I find that these these imp improvised or open conversations are are definitely the best. And mm -hmm. also going back to something that you said before, I think the the uh, what is holding people back these days is always the fear of of saying something wrong mm -hmm. or of of uh, you know like um, not fitting in, let's say, or right. Or, or that you create that you create some sort of situation for yourself where you're getting into trouble that will uh, uh, be in the way of your career, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but I, you know, and I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm myself a victim of this. Could be like I could have had a much better or bigger career if I had considered what I'm saying, or even like if I had considered what kind of music I'm making, or with, right. and and but. But then there's no point not to be myself, really. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> at least, I, at least that's what I'm thinking. I don't know. Maybe that's wrong. You know, and like, or you know, you could ask the question in the other direction. So, what about people who have a certain success in, like, say, making a lot of money? Like, what is the price? Mm -hmm. That's that's the question, really. What would be that price? What's that price? Like I'm paying a price for being who I am, but uh, somebody who is not himself, what what kind of what what does what does that person pay really? And I really don't want I don't even want to know because I don't want to be in that situation. Right. Yeah, well, but I think it's because you know. I mean, you know what it means. You you see the difference, I think, and, and um, uh, yeah. so you 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 understand the implications, you know. Yeah. And you see, this is this is the kind of uh, the kind of person that I do want to work with, and I, I we talked about that before. This is sort of like my 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 professional, but also like my 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 uh, like my the interest of my heart. Let's say to work with these people who do want to kind of re reconnect with who they really are. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's such a such an important thing because as you as you call it before, like the money the uh, the, the the system right that, that everything that's kind of like uh, a lot of that is geared towards making people just be robots as you say like even as a creative producer you then become into a situation where you act like a robot and and just kind of like rediscovering um, who you really are that is that really is a big challenge for a lot of people especially in at my age like I'd say like 40 and 40 and up that is a big big issue a big question mm -hmm. and um well i mean it's it's um let's say i have a lot of respect and some you know form of admiration for people who um from an early age on sort of knew exactly what they wanted and they stayed this way and followed it through um until they till their their, 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 their you know, higher age but um mm -hmm. Cannot say that that happened for me, but I, I feel that that's sort of like at this point of my life, and I'm like, what am I now? 42, I think. <laughs> um, is that um, I, f I I feel exactly what you're describing? Is that I, I feel like I'm I'm slowly returning to sort of to um, not the person, but sort of sort of the the, the mindset that I had when I was younger. And the uh, mm -hmm. ideals that I had, and the the, the the ethics, and so on, and and and, but I've had this long voyage in between, of stepping out of that and going different ways, and and now it has become, now it's gotten a completely different meaning. It's funny that that many 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 of my um, ideas of the the way I think, you know, of what is good, right and what is wrong, that hasn't changed much, but it has gotten a very different meaning. And I, I found that um, at least it's very rare, if not impossible, that if, if you want to arrive at that place uh, of deeper understanding, you have to go through some sort of suffering, <laughs> unless uh, you know um, you're born with that understanding of the world. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm grateful for that, but I wish it could have been a little bit less painful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's part of it's part of life, right? And it's 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 actually it actually is. Uh, 
you could say there is there is actually life before death, and that's why we experience this. Ah, okay. <laughs> and and, and yeah. you see, so and then. <laughs> <laughs> So that's one of one way of, of reframing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dirk. Um, awesome. Yeah, Thanks thank so you much. very much. This was great. Yeah. And um, yeah. let's say goodbye for now. And I'll talk to you right. soon. And I'll see you in a few weeks uh, for a recording project. This Absolutely. will be great. Yes. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So, yeah. see you. Bye bye yeah. for now. Yeah, right. Ciao. Ciao.